Does everybody understand how close we came to disaster? Because we came pretty close to disaster. We almost had all of our Cardano caviar wishes and champagne dreams and hopes dashed at the foot of Gary Gensler's SEC desk. That's a terrible fate to befall anyone, let alone all of us in Cardano and in the broader crypto ecosystem. And so far, we've only been saved by a couple of individuals, a couple of human beings in the federal judiciary. See what I did there? I gave our federal judge some sunglasses and a stick to hit people with. You might think that's highly inappropriate. And if you do, you've probably never heard of Gary Gensler. In any case, please consider delegating to the Army of Spies stake pool, ticker AOS. I don't think it can be emphasized enough how much Judge Torres saved us. She had a big decision to make, and she probably guessed correctly that it had the potential to turn the momentum of the entire regulatory arc of crypto. It had a big, a big chance of determining a lot of the policy for crypto. Sure, uh, her decision could be overturned at the circuit court, at the Supreme Court, anything could happen. It's it's the judicial system. But her decision also had a big opportunity to either turn crypto in a direction where we could actually have crypto in the US or in a direction where crypto would simply exist, cease to exist as a decentralized permissionless thing and sort of become a creature that had been captured by legacy institutions and you know regulated by the Gary Gensler's of the world. She didn't make that decision. She decided to push crypto in the direction of freedom, you know, of being free of the shackles of this how we test investment contract security determination. She pushed us in in, in the direction of freedom and the wilds, not in the direction of confinement and captivity. And, you know, of course, I'm sure this decision was a result of just plain old good jurisprudence. I'm sure she decided that that was the correct interpretation of the law. But I think it's it's not unfair to say that there might have been a policy decision. She might have looked at the entire crypto landscape and said to herself, what's better for the United States? for crypto to be a free thing that blossoms and flourishes or for it to be um, a creature of captivity taken over by the legacy institutions and highly regulated by these Gensler types of the world. And she chose for us to have you know, the freedom to become something that might blossom and flourish. We don't know what the future holds. Like I said, we could be, uh, that decision could be overturned in the in the circuit court or even in the Supreme Court. We don't know the future holds. It's the judicial system. But for now, she chose freedom. And one of the most important pieces of this is not just the immediate effects in the Ripple case, what it means for Ripple and you know what that, um, what that uh, district court precedent might mean in the future. I think the more important piece of this is the signaling effect because one federal district court judge was able to stand up and change the course of the momentum because the SEC's never lost a case in crypto. So there's a lot of momentum behind that pattern continuing. But because one judge, Judge Torres, stood up and changed the direction of that momentum, now we see a lot of other policymakers being willing to stand up because they're in politics. No matter what the right policy might be, they don't want to get caught fighting a losing war. But now Judge Torres has stood up and changed the direction of that regulatory arc for crypto. We see other other policymakers doing the same. Here we see Representative Richie Torres. This is a different person than Judge Torres. This is the congressman, not the federal judge. So Richie Torres says, needless to say, regulating digital assets through enforcement only. Had a dreadful day in court last week in the wake of the resounding decision out of the Southern District of New York Ripple case. That's the Judge Torres case. The SEC must reassess its continued assault on the crypto industry. My letter to Chair Gensler. And this is quite a letter indeed. Now ask yourself, if this letter had been written the week before the Ripple decision, would it have looked like this? This is the kind of signaling effect of this kind of decision by Judge Torres. So Richie Torres writes, 
Dear Chair Gensler, I'm writing to inquire if the SEC intends to come to terms with the folly of the commission's crusade against crypto assets in light of the la latest decision by Judge Annalisa Torres of the Southern District of New York. Needless to say, regulation by enforcement had a dreadful day in court. Note, these guys are in the same party. This is not a Republican going after a Democrat or vice versa. These guys are on the same side. In a landmark legal opinion, Judge Torres resoundingly rejected the regulatory overreach of the SEC, which has been indiscriminately declaring all crypto assets except Bitcoin to be securities by emphasizing the need to to prove the presence of an investment contract, Judge Torres's reasoning represents a return to a rigorous application of the Howey test, which has been applied sloppily by the SEC. These are scathing criticisms. Indeed, the latest court decision establishes a clear rule that should bear the name of Judge Torres, who has brought long overdue legal clarity to the chaos of crypto regulation. The Torres Doctrine, as I call it, I love this, Richie Torres, of course, you have the same surname, but I love this, I'm gonna start calling it the Torres Doctrine, holds that crypto assets are not securities in themselves, but can be sold as part of investment contracts, which do qualify as securities under the Howey test. Judge Torres has made it crystal clear to the SEC that digital assets are not securities in the abstract, and that it lacks the legal authority to regulate digital assets untethered from an actual security offering. So this is not the kind of thing we saw Democrats saying about Gary Gensler, you know, prior to this decision, maybe in some isolated cases, we had some rogue, some rogue Democrats saying very critical stuff uh, related to Gary Gensler, but we didn't see anything like this from a very promising young member of Congress on the same side as Gary Gensler. Like I said, one of the most important things that's going to follow this Judge Torres decision is will the SEC appeal? So here are a couple opinions on sort of part of that question. This person, this poster is the partner and head of regulatory and policy at Bain Capital Crypto and formerly of the SEC may know a thing or two about what's going on in the heads of the decision makers of the SEC. They say, another question I'm getting a lot is about appeals. A party can only appeal a final order and a summary judgment decision that disposes of some but not all claims is not considered a final order. So you may have seen some chatter about this on crypto law Twitter. So if SEC wants to appeal Ripple summary judgment decision, it has to wait for trial to conclude. SEC has two ways around this if it wants to appeal now. Dismiss claims against the execs, so no trial equals order is final. Makes sense. They just dismiss the rest of their claims. Or seek an interlocutory appeal for the seeking of an interlocutory appeal. It has to get permission from both the district and circuit court, and the bar to get this is extremely high. Under the federal rules of civil procedure and appellate procedure, they have a very short window to obtain permission to file an interlocutory appeal. In fact, that they haven't done so already suggests they're not planning to, in my opinion. So why would they not want to appeal at this point, or maybe even at any point in the near future? So why might the SEC not want to appeal the Ripple case? For the reason laid out in this tweet, which is a summary of a longer tweet thread that is also an article on Coindesk. The poster says, SEC may not want to appeal because they know that this starts a road that ends up at the U.S. Supreme Court where they do not like their chances as their overreach will become the litigated issue. What does everyone who's paying attention in the U.S. know about the current U.S. Supreme Court? That it leans conservative. And what do conservatives like? They like small federal government, not big federal government. They like small federal government. And they don't like the kind of overreach that Gary Gensler's SEC has been engaged in very aggressively. So I could believe this. This may be the case. It may be that this SEC looks at the U.S. Supreme Court and especially some of the very controversial cases lately and says to themselves, hey, if we go to the U.S. Supreme Court, if we go to the circuit court, if we appeal to the circuit court, that means eventually we could end up in the U.S. Supreme Court and they're going to look at what we're doing. And the issue that gets litigated is not going to be the Howey test. It's not going to be you know, crypto as security or not, it's going to be our overreach. And that Supreme Court does not seem like the type that would be sympathetic to our cause. So this may be very, very good for us in crypto and very bad for the SEC. So the other big question, why haven't we seen a big backlash against this new Torres doctrine? 
why hasn't there been a lot of heat? Why hasn't there been a big reaction from the anti-crypto army against Judge Torres and her decision? It's explained well here. It's really because Judge Torres was supposed to be on the same team as the anti-crypto people. It's just that common sense overrode any allegiance to the team that those those people, the anti-crypto people, thought they were on. So this article says, this uh, post says, has anyone else noticed that the attacks on Judge Torres and her ripple decision have been pretty tame, all things considered? No mean tweets from the dragon, no apparent mobilization of the anti-crypto army, no scathing editorial in the New York Times. This makes sense because George Judge Torres is smart and has credentials, Harvard undergrad, Columbia Law. She served as a Democrat appointed New York State court judge for years. So same team as Warren Gensler and all. Both her father and grandfather were judges and served in the New York State Assembly. And importantly, Judge Torres was appointed to the federal bench by President Barack Obama. This has all helped to lower the temperature around this important ruling. Nobody believes Judge Torres is out to help the crypto bros. She just applied the law without fear or favor. Well done. This is the entire point of separation of powers and even within within the judiciary, blind justice. This is the way it's supposed to happen. A judge, a district, a federal district court judge like Judge Torres is supposed to look at the facts and circumstances and apply the law. She's supposed to interpret the law. That's her job. It's not supposed to be about left and right, Democrat and Republican. So this is probably all very confusing to the anti-crypto army and the current administration who, of course, are on the left because Judge Torres was an Obama appointee. And yet she still sided with all of us senseless crypto bros. When I said that there was a signaling function to Judge Torres's decision, it doesn't just send a signal to policymakers in Congress. It also blazes a path for other judges. And it seems that we're already seeing that in the SEC v. Coinbase case in the pretrial conference transcript. So you could argue that maybe ju the judge in this Coinbase case could have come to the exact same position in this pretrial conference without the Judge Torres decision. But I think the Judge Torres decision is definitely playing a role in all of this. So we sort of see this throughout the transcript. The judge seems to very much understand the position of Coinbase and be puzzled at certain points by the position of the SEC counsel. So it's starting with this. So the judge asks, I would like to understand because I think it is presented to me as a matter of optics, yet it is of interest to me. How do you, and by you, I mean your clients, can, she's speaking to SEC counsel here, contextualize Mr. Gensler's testimony? How do you contextualize what he was saying about the absence of market regulation of crypto assets? So we all remember when Gary Gensler said, hey, we don't have, we don't have authority to regulate the crypto markets. She says, is it your view that actually, I understand, I think that you're suggesting that this wasn't a stopple and that perhaps minds could be changed, but he did seem to suggest, and I thought he was speaking for the commission when he did so, that the SEC could not or did not regulate transactions of this type. What has changed? We all remember Gary Gensler said, hey, we don't have authority to regulate crypto. I'm paraphrasing, but something to that effect. SEC counsel says, Your Honor, I think that we have to go back. What we have to go back to is the actual context. And I'm sure Your Honor has read it just beyond the snippet. I think if we go back to the actual transcript, you see that the question was asked. I believe it involved Bitcoin, which is not an issue here. And the SEC has made clear that that's not the focus of any of these enforcement actions. So they're making the claim that when Gensler said he didn't have authority to regulate crypto, that he was only talking about Bitcoin. <laughs> so this is laughable to me, not very convincing. I think we all know Gensler was talking broadly about crypto. Here we have another one. SEC claims they're not trying to regulate all of the crypto industry. Uh, the counsel for the SEC said the SEC is not attempting to regulate all of the crypto industry in this country or around the world. We regulate conduct and we are regulating Coinbase's conduct, which we believe violates the law. That, of course, conflicts with what we've heard from Gary Gensler over and over and over again, that the assets themselves are securities. Sure, you could argue that he's making this implicit argument that it, there are investment, there's inv there's conduct creating the investment contracts that makes them securities, but we all know that's not the decision that Judge Torres came to. She did not agree with that argument. Um, so the SEC 
uh, council also was willing to say the following, that Bitcoin is not a security and that the count, the uh, commission has not spoken on Ethereum. I believe the commission has spoken on Bitcoin. I do not believe that the commission has spoken definitively on Ether. So, of course, this was a big issue in the Ripple case. The speech, the famous Heinemann speech, when he said that Ethereum was not a security and the issue was whether or not he was speaking on behalf of the SEC or just in his personal capacity. Another big issue that's already coming up in this Coinbase case is the fact that Coinbase filed an S1 registration statement and it was approved by the SEC. The SEC essentially approved Coinbase's going public and didn't say a thing about the Coinbase's business, which is largely the same as it is today. So if what they were doing was illegal under the securities laws, now then it would have been illegal back then and yet they still approved the s1 registration statement so the judge asks hey what am i supposed to make of this am i supposed to make anything of the fact that two years later we are here and you guys approved the issuance of the registration statement sec council says uh the short answer is no your honor should take nothing from that that was his answer very short the court says, let me have a slightly longer answer. Always a bad sign when the court is prodding you to give a longer answer and you don't want to. The counsel for the SEC says, your honor, I'll say that simply because the SEC allows a company to go public does not mean that the SEC is blessing the underlying business or the underlying business structure or saying that the underlying business structure is not in violation of the law. However, oddly, I think if I tried to start you know, um, a narcotics distribution company an illegal narcotics trafficking company, and I tried to take that company public, I think the SEC would object. I think they do look at whether or not the underlying business is legal or illegal. So sure, they can say, hey, you know, us, um, us agreeing with the issuance for registration statement is not a guarantee that we're blessing the legality of the underlying business. But surely they get so much disclosure in those registration statements. Surely they're looking at whether or not the business is legal or not. Uh, the court is having a very hard time swallowing this argument by SEC counsel. The court says, let's just pause so I can just sort of get rid of the skepticism I'm, I currently have as I hear that answer. I'm not saying the commission should be omniscient at the time it's evaluating a registration statement and that it should know all things, but I would have thought the commission was doing diligence into what Coinbase was doing. And somehow I thought that it would say, you know, you really shouldn't do this. This is, a, this is violative of the securities laws, or we are kind of in some interesting uncharted charted territory here with respect to what the assets on your platform are securities. So be forewarned that maybe someday there could be a problem. And yet the SEC didn't do any of those things. And the judge doesn't like that. You know, if it was, if it was illegal, then she thinks the SEC would have said something. So that issue did not go well for the SEC. The court isn't buying into that argument at all. This big problem for the SEC. The court, you never could have said to them, hey, you guys need to register as a securities exchange. That was within the power of the SEC to do it, was it not? SEC counsel says, I can't really speak to that. So think about this. The SEC's attorneys are saying they can't speak to whether or not the SEC could have said, hey, you're a securities exchange. These are securities. Register as a securities exchange. <laughs> So she, she asked, was that within the power of the SEC? He says, I can't speak to that. She says, I think it was. I think it was within the power of the SEC. I don't think anything stopped the commission from doing it. I am not suggesting, sir, that this is dispositive or that there is an estoppel issue, but it's not crazy in her own parlance, the judge's parlance, for Coinbase to think that what they were doing was okay because it was exactly what you let them do when you issued the S1. That's the point I'm making. You may say that they and I are reading too much into the issuance of the S1. SEC counsel, I'd agree with that. The court, I might disagree with that, but I do understand. So here, the SEC counsel is directly disagreeing with the judge and she's disagreeing with him. Very bad for SEC counsel. On staking, we saw some very interesting points for Cardano. So SEC counsel said, by the way, I don't think the SEC and Coinbase dispute much with respect to staking. I think it's how you characterize the efforts and whether investor assets are actually invested and there is risk of loss. 
So I think you know where this is going in the context of Cardano. Our position is, at least for 12C, we have alleged that they are put at risk. I think that's pretty clear. Whether the relevant staking protocol goes under, or whether private keys associated with crypto assets that are staked get lost, whether there is a cybersecurity incident for a number of reasons, as we have alleged. So the SEC, at least in this case with Coinbase, is fo focusing very heavily on the assets that are staked being put at risk. This is simply not the same thing in the context of Cardano, where we keep custody of our own assets when we stake. We don't have slashing in our protocol. So unlike something like an Ethereum, we do not have to send our assets anywhere when we delegate in our proof of stake system. We keep our own assets. We have self-custody of our own assets. They can't do that in Ethereum because they have to be able to slash the assets. That's the, how their whole system works. That's the fundamental flaw. That's the shortcoming in Ethereum staking. And that is all the SEC is focused on here. You notice their whole discussion is about risk of loss and the types of risk of loss they, they cite. Uh, private keys getting lost. Uh, the staking protocol going under, you know, which is pretty unlikely. I think in the case of these larger cap assets, uh, whether there's a cybersecurity incident, these would be like hacks and exploits, robbery for stuff. None of the none of those things. Sure, you could say maybe the staking protocol could go under with any staking protocol, but beyond that, the rest of these things are all things that only happen in the staking context where you don't have custody of your own assets. So this wouldn't really these things wouldn't really apply to Cardano, which is great news for us. So. Then the SEC gets into some circular logic. So they say, I think I said this before, but it's important, and I'm going to say it again. Coinbase's argument seems to be that if there is a violation of securities law by a crypto company or a crypto player in the sphere, there is no power to civilly or criminally enforce that violation based on the major questions doctrine. So we talked about the major questions doctrine previously. I won't go back into that right now. The SEC says, we think that's an incorrect reading of the case law. So they're kind of trying to create this straw man argument. They're, they're claiming that Coinbase is claiming that no one can regulate crypto. There, can, there cannot be any regulation of crypto. And the court kind of starts to pick up on the circularity of some of these, uh, some of these arguments down below here. So... Uh, the court says, I thought I heard you say a few sentences ago that the question was not whether the commission wanted to regulate the entire crypto industry, but whether it wanted to regulate those assets that are found to be securities. Perhaps you can just restate that position because I want to make sure that I have, have it with greater clarity. Sure, the commission regulates conduct that falls under the securities law, and we so conduct. And we believe that's Coinbase's, that Coinbase's conduct has violated securities law. That's it. We are not looking to regulate through this action the entire crypto industry. So you see the problem here, right? They say, hey, this isn't a major questions doctrine thing because we're just regulating conduct. This isn't about whether crypto assets are securities because sure, then we get into the whole discussion between the recent... Uh, Supreme Court decision and the older Chevron doctrine. We don't want to get into that. We're just talking about conduct. We're not even talking about those assets because we're afraid we might lose on the major questions doctrine stuff. And we know we will at the Supreme Court, as we talked about previously in this video. So this is what the SEC is saying. They're saying, hey, let's not talk about major questions doctrine. Let's just talk about conduct. The court comes back with, I guess I hear you. I'm just wondering where we go with that because it seems to me in trying to determine what conduct within the industry falls within the purview of the commission, it does sort of sound to me that you have to consider all the conduct in the industry. So she makes a good point. If conduct is going to be violative of the securities law, there must be some kind of security involved in mo most cases. So the SEC is kind of saying, hey, it's not about whether these assets are securities or not. Let's not even talk about that because we're afraid we might, you know, that might, uh, that might invoke the major questions doctrine stuff and we're afraid we might lose on that one. But then the court comes along and they're like, yeah, but if you guys are saying there's conduct going on here that violates securities laws, there must be some kind of security involved, right? So really, we do have to look at whether or not these assets are securities. Uh, they, the court says, I hear you saying, I do, that it's not a question of the commission purporting to regulate the entire crypto, crypto asset industry, but I'm just saying there is a tension between making that argument and then having to determine in this rather unique space, what are the things you actually get to regulate? That's my only point. 
SEC counsel responds simply with understood. He doesn't have a good comeback on that one. He, has, he doesn't have a counter argument. She's saying, hey, you keep claiming it's not about the assets. It's just about conduct. But this, we're talking about securities law here. So there must be a security somewhere, right? We do actually have to determine if there are any assets that are securities. And then they come back to the S1 issue again. It's very clear from this pretrial conference transcript that this is going to be a very big issue in this case. And it should be. If we're to have a well-functioning administrative state, if the bureaucracy is going to function well and they're actually going to regulate stuff, we can't have the bureaucracy going through every last detail of disclosure about a company's business in an S1 registration statement. And then two years later coming back and saying, oh, we know we okayed your registration statement, but we're, we're still gonna pop up now all of a sudden and say that what you're doing is illegal. So the court says, it's clear that the commission has repeatedly refused to review authorized registration statements for companies because of concerns about the legality about their underlying business. So the court's saying, you guys have refused to review registration statements because you had concerns about legality. It has done that repeatedly with cannabis companies. It did it repeatedly with betting companies. And here, securities registration is the core competency of this agency. So the SEC wouldn't review cannabis company registration statements, wouldn't review betting company registration statements when cannabis law and gaming law are not their specialties. Here, they're saying they did not review securities legality when that's their core competency as the SEC. So the idea that the commission could authorize the offer and sell of Coinbase's securities to millions of retail investors and then turn around and flip-flop and say, oh, sorry, you are running a completely illegal business, but not merely that, an S1 registration statement for Coinbase to provide the very platform that apparently I'm being told today violates the securities laws. That's what you're really saying. So the court is very troubled by the SEC's flip-flop, and I think that's the right way to describe it. Finally, the court says, I have to say, so this is the uh, SEC counsel. I have to say, I disagree with most of what Coinbase counsel said, but I know, and then the court apparently cut him off, I am not shocked. So the court is saying, I am not, the judge is saying, I'm not shocked that the SEC disagrees with Coinbase. SEC comes back. I just want to put that out there. We have, and then she cuts him off again. Government disagrees. SEC disagrees. Understood. I'm writing it down so you can tell the court is already not sympathetic to the arguments of the SEC, and they do seem to be either neutral or sympathetic to the arguments of Coinbase, really sympathetic, especially on this S1 and registration statement thing. I think the court realizes that a government isn't dealing in good faith with a company like Coinbase when they're okaying a registration statement and then two years later coming back and saying, oh, all of a sudden everything's illegal, we've flip-flopped. You can't do that and have a well-functioning government. I hope you're having a great week and I'll talk to you soon.